the Lady of Gotherus by T. Crofton Croker. On the shore of Smerrick Harbor, one fine summer morning, just at daybreak, stood Dick Fitzgerald, showing the Dean, which may be translated, smoking his pipe. The sun was gradually rising behind the lofty Brandon, and the dark sea was setting was getting green in the light, and the mist clearing away all the alleys all of the valleys went rolling and crowing like the smoke from the corner of Dick's mouth. "'Tis just the pattern of a pretty morning," said Dick, taking his pipe from between his lips and looking toward the distant ocean, which lay as still and tranquil as a tomb polished, pol yeah, of polished marble. "'Well, to be sure,' continued he, after a pause, "'tis mighty lonesome to be talking to oneself, by the way, of company, and not to have another soul to answer one. Nothing but the child of one's own voice, the echo. I know this, as if I had the luck, or maybe the misfortune, said Dick, with a melancholy smile. To have the woman, it would be not the way with me. And what a wide world is a man without a wife. He is no more surely a bottle without a drop to drink of it, or dancing without music. Or the left leg of a scissor, or the fishing line without a hook, or any other matter that is no way complete. Is it not so? said Dick Fitzgerald, casting his eyes upon a rock, casting his eyes towards a rock upon the strand, which Though it could not speak, stood up as firm and looked as bold as ever Carrie witness did. But what was his astonishment at beholding, just at the foot of the rock, a beautiful young creature combing her hair, which was the sea green color, and now the salt water shimmering on it, appeared in the morning light like melted butter upon cabbage. Dick guessed at once that she was a marrow, although he had not seen one before, for he spied the Gohlund Roth, or the enchanted cap, which the sea people used for diving down into the ocean, lying upon the ground near her. And he had heard that if once he could possess himself one of the cap, she would lose the power of going away into the water. So he seized it with all speed, and she, hearing the noise, turned her head about as natural as any Christian. When the Murrow saw that her little diving cap was gone, the salt tears, deathly salt, no doubt, from her, came trickling down her cheeks, and she began a low mournful cry with just the tender voice of a newborn infant. Dick, although he knew enough that she was crying for, determined to keep the Colindreth let her cry never so much to see what to see what luck would come of it. Yet he could not help pitying her, and when the dumb thing looked at his face, her cheeks all moist with tears. It was enough to make one f to make anyone feel let alone. Dick, who was ever and always like most of his countrymen, a mighty tender heart of his own. Don't cry, my darling," said Dick Fitzgerald. But the marrow, like any new, any bold child, only cried more at that. Dick sat himself down by her side and took hold of her hand by way of comforting her. It was no particular and ugly hand; only there was a small web between the fingers, as there is in a duck's foot. But it was as thin and as white as the skin between. The egg and shell. What's your name, my darling? says Dick, thinking to make some conversation with him. But he got no answer, and he was certain sure he was certain sure now, either that she could not speak or did not understand him. He therefore squeezed her hand, and in the only way he had to talk to her. It's a universal language, and there's not a woman in the world be fish or lady that does not understand it.
Romero did not seem displeased at his mode of conversation and making an end of her whining all at once. Man, said she, looking up at Dick Fitzgerald's face. Man, will you eat me? But all oh, the red petticoats and the check aprons between Dingle and Trally, cried Dick, jumping up in amazement. I'd as soon eat myself, my jewel. Is it I eat you, my pet? No, oh, it was some ugly, ill-looking thief of a fish put that notion into your own pretty head. With the nice green hair down upon it, that is so cleanly combed out this morning. Man, said the morrow, what will you do with me if you won't eat me? Dick's thoughts were running on the wife he saw at, first, at the first glimpse, and she was handsome. But since she spoke, and spoke too like any real woman, he was fairly in love with her. It was the neat way she called him man that settled the matter entirely. Fish, says Dick, trying to speak her after his own short fashion. Fish, says he, here's my word, fresh and fasting. For you this blessed morning, I'll make you Mistress Fitzgerald before all the world. That's what I'll do. Never say that word twice, says she. I'm ready and willing to be yours, Mr. Fitzgerald, but stop, if you please, till I twist up my hair. It was some time before she had settled upon entirely to her liking, for she guessed, I suppose, that she was going among strangers, where the world, where she would be looked at. When that was done, the Meryl put the comb in her pockets and then bent down her head and whispered some words to the water that was close to the foot of the rock. Dick saw the murmur of the words upon the top of the sea, going out towards the wide ocean, just like a breath of wind rippling along him, says he in great wonder. Is it speaking you are, my darling, to the salt water? It's nothing else, she says, quite carelessly. I'm just sending word home to my father not to be waiting breakfast with me, just to keep him from being uneasy in his mind. And who's your father, my duck? said Dick. What? said the morrow. Did you never hear of my father? He's the king of the waves, to be sure. And yourself, then? He's a real king's daughter? said Dick, opening his two eyes to make a full, true survey of his wife that was to be. Oh, I'm nothing but a made man with you, and the king, your father. But to be sure, he has all the money that's down in the bottom of the sea. Money, repeated the morrow. What's money? Tis no bad thing to have when one wants it, replied Dick. And may be now the fishes have the understanding to bring up whatever you bid them. Oh, yes, said the marrow. They bring me what I want. To speak the truth, then, said Dick. To the straw bed I have at home before you. That I thinking in no fitting way as a king's daughter, so if it was not be displeasing to you just to mention a nice feather bed with a pair of new blankets. But what am I talking about? Maybe you have not such things, in be things as beds underwater. By all means, she said. Mr. Fitzgerald, plenty of beds at your service. I have fourteen oyster beds of my own, not to mention one just planting for the rearing of young ones. You have, says Dick, scratching his head and looking a bit puzzled. Tis a feather bed I was speaking of. But clearly yours is a very cut and decent plan. To have bed and supper so handy to each other, that person, when they have to need one, never need to ask for another. However, bed or no bed, money or no money, Dick Fitzgerald determined to marry the morrow, and the morrow had given her consent. Where they went before the strand, from Gullerus to Bollinrid, Bowen running, where Father Fitzgibbons happened to be that morning. 
There are two words in this bargain, Dick Fitzgerald, said his reverence, looking mighty glum. And it is a fishy woman you'd marry. The Lord preserve us. Send this gaily creature home to her own people. That's my advice to you, wherever she came from. Dick had the curl and growth in his hand, and was about to give it back to the marrow, who looked covetously at it. But then he thought for a moment and said, then, and then, says he, Please, your reverence, she's a king's daughter. She was the daughter of fifty kings, said Father Fitzgibbons. I tell you, you can't marry her, she being a fish. Please, your reverence, said Dick again, in an undertone. She is as mild and beautiful as the moon. If she was as mild as beautiful as the sun, moon, and the stars all put together, I tell you, Dick Fitzgerald, said the priest, stamping his right foot, you can't marry her, she being a fish. <laughs> but she has all the gold that's down in the sea, only for the asking. I'm a made man if I'd marry her, and, said Dick, looking up silly, I can make it worth your while if anyone's to do the job. Oh, that alters the case entirely, replied the priest. Why, well, there's some reason now in what you say. Why didn't you tell me this before? Marry her by all means if she was ten times a fish. Money, you know, is not to be refused in these bad times. And I may as well have a hands off of it as another. That may be would take half the pains of counseling you that I've done. So Father Fitzgibbon married Dick Fitzgerald to the marrow, and like any loving couple, they returned to Gullers well pleased with each other. Everything prospered with Dick. He was the sunny side of the world. The marrow met the best of wives, and they lived together with the greatest contentment. It was wonderful to see, considering where she had been brought up, how she would busy herself about the house, and how she was... Nurse the children, and for the end of three years, there were as many young Fitzgerald, two boys and a girl. In short, Dick was a happy man, and so he might have continued to the end of his days if he had only the sense to take proper care of what he had got. Many another man, however, beside Dick, had not the wit to do enough. One day, when Dick was obliged to go to Trally, he left his wife, mindless, minding the children at the home after him, thinking she had plenty to do without disturbing his fishing tackle. Dick was no sooner gone than Mrs. Fitzgerald set about cleaning up the house and glancing to pull down his fishing nets. But what should she find behind the hole in the wall but her own shimmer drewis? She took it out and looked at it. And then she thought of her father, the king, and the mother, the queen, and her brothers and sisters, and she felt a longing to go back to them. She sat down on a little stool and thought over the happy days she had spent under the sea, and when she looked at her children and thought of the love and affection of poor Dick, and how it would break his heart to lose her. But, says she, you won't lose me entirely, for I'll come back to see him again. And who can blame me for going to see my father and mother after being so long away from them? She got up and went towards the door, but came back again to look once more at the child that was sleeping still in the cradle. She kissed it gently, and she, as she kissed it, the tear trembled for an instant on her eye and fell to its rosy cheek. She wiped away the tear, turning to the eldest little girl, told her to take good care of her brothers, and to be a good child herself until she came back. The marrow then went down to the strand. The sea was lying calm and smooth, just heaving, glittering on the sun, and she thought she heard a faint, sing faint sweet singing inviting her to come down. All her old ideas and feelings were flooding back over in her mind. Dick and her children, the instant forgotten, and placing the cooling dean on her head, she plunged in. Dick came home in the evening, missing his wife. Yes, Kathleen, the little girl, 
what had become of her mother, and she could not tell him. Then she inquired of the neighbors, and he leaned, learned that she was seen going towards the strand with a strange-looking thing, like a cocked hat in her hand. He returned to his cabin to search for the clothing doeth. It was gone, and the truth flashed upon him. Year after year did Dick Fitzgerald wait expectantly at the return for his wife, but he never saw her more. Dick never married again, and was thinking that the marrow would sooner or later return to him, and nothing could persuade him that her father was a king. Kept her below the force for said Dick. She surely would have not given herself up, given up her father, husband and her children. While she was with him, she was a good wife in every respect. That, to this day, she is spoken of in tradition of the country, with a pattern of one under the name of the Lady of Gullers.